Good morning, everyone. I'm going to start you out with something to uh, just get you really excited and ready to go, so pay attention. Oh, hi. Sorry. Uh, caught me. I, I was just getting ready to uh, put my presentation together for you, and I wanted to make sure I understood the new Affordable Care Act. And, and I was kind of caught in this one section here, and I wondered maybe you could help me understand it. It's under... Um, a section called Increased FMAP for Medical Assistance for Newly Eligible Mandatory Individuals. And I'm down in subparagraph 2A two, um, two called Newly Eligible. Uh, maybe you can help me understand this. Uh, newly Eligible. The term Newly Eligible means with respect to an individual described in subclause 8 of section 1902A10A1, or is that I, an individual who is not under 19 years of age or such higher age as the state may have elected, and who as of December 1st, 2009 is not eligible under the state plan or under a waiver of the plan for full benefits or for benchmark coverage described in subparagraph A, B, or C of section 1937B1 or benchmark equivalent coverage described in section 1937B2 that has an aggregate actuarial value that is at least actuarially equivalent to benchmark coverage described in subparagraph A, B, or C of section 1937B1, or is eligible but not enrolled, or is on a waiting list for such benefits or coverage through a waiver under the plan that has a capped or limited enrollment that is full. Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's frightening about that is it's only two paragraphs out of the whole bill. And uh, when you think about what uh, you know, the impact of the Affordable Care Act on not just your profession, but on the, uh, the public, uh, it's incredible. Who can even find what that stuff means? And it's grown a whole industry of people trying to translate it for everybody else. It's an amazing contraption we put together when the answer is really pretty simple. Uh, my name is Dave Racer. I'm a writer, author, uh, written, I don't know, I guess eight books now on healthcare reform, and had the pleasure of doing that with some of the people in this room, Dr. Carisco, Ralph Weber, Glenn Gruenhagen, who will not be speaking today, but is a state representative. We did a book together. He had several other books on healthcare reform. Never thought that this would become my passion. And then one day, um, I heard about cash practice doctoring. And it made so much sense to me that about a year and a half ago, I decided that I had to have a, a cash practice doctor. Now, my doctor uh, is on a, um, on a trip today, celebrating his 40th anniversary. Otherwise, he would be here. But I have to tell you a story about my doctor. Because uh, Christmas Eve morning, I was down on my treadmill doing my normal thing. And all of a sudden, I had a sense in my head that went like this. It just went up from my neck, across my head, and my ears pinched off. And I said, what in the world is going on? And my head started hurting. And I thought, something is really odd here. This is not normal. And uh, I reached over and pulled the treadmill up, you know, like you do. And my head just exploded in pain. So I went upstairs got my cell phone out, and called my doctor on his cell phone. And my doctor listened to my concerns. And you know what? He knows me so well. He knows me from top to bottom, because when we get together, he doesn't sit and look at an iPad, or he doesn't sit and look at his laptop. He looks at me. In fact, I accuse him of getting in my space. That's how intense he is. And he knows me so well that he knew this was not normal for Dave Racer. And he said, is your wife there? And I said, yes, she is. You tell her to take you to the closest emergency room. Don't bother with the ambulance. Just get there. And when you go in, tell them that your doctor thinks you're having a brain bleed and you need a CT scan. Well, here I am. <laughs> uh, 11 days in ICU, another four days at St. Jo Joseph's Hospital in St. Paul. And uh, what an experience in my whole life. I, I'm going to be 66 next, next month, Lord willing. Never had anything like this before. 
what would have happened if I would have called uh, you know, on Christmas Eve morning and gotten the triage nurse and all of this and sat there and waited and worried, not confident that my doctor knew exactly what was going on. Well, when Dr. Gehrig came to see me in the hospital, I looked at him and I said, you saved my life. Well, at least you saved my quality of life. Why? Because he knew me and I knew him. And I knew that every time I went to see him, I was going to pay $60. So I made the decision. I was in control, but I trusted him. Do you think I'm a believer in direct pay independent practice? One of the reasons that you're here today uh, is partly because of my commitment to doing everything I can to advance private market health care. And uh, when you've had an experience like this, boy, you can become an advocate. By the way, that's how much my hospital stay uh, costs. Well, that was the build amount, as you all know. has nothing to do with what the, the hospital got paid. Hospital got paid about $68,000. This did not include, of course, the uh, MD fees. So what is it that we're about? What the uh, ACA does, and you've seen this, I'm sure many of you have seen this before. Uh, one of the doctors in Las Vegas, when I spoke down there at AAPS, <laughs> showed me something I hadn't seen before, and that's the patient way over here on that side, and the doctor way over there on that side. What's that about? How does that work with Dave Racer and Dr. Gehrig, his cash-only doctor? It doesn't work, because I've got to go through that maze, and I've got to answer to this woman whose name appears, or title appears in that bill over 3,000 times. I've got to be concerned about 159 boards, study groups, and uh, policy makers, and 1968 new regulations and policy regulation, no longer in my doctor's office, but in Washington, D.C. Uh, the ongoing trouble that we're experiencing with guidelines and rules, it's unbelievable. I spend a lot of time with the insurance agent community, and they are absolutely frightened because they don't know, just like their employers, just like individuals are trying to figure out what in the world the rules are going to be, and nobody really knows at this point. So, what reform does this? This is the one I'm looking for, the one that takes that patient and that doctor and does this. Brings a doctor and patient back together in a close relationship so that we can have real medicine performed. That's what this conference is about, I believe. And uh, that's why I'm excited that you all are here today. We have an awesome lineup of speakers uh, from all across the country, many from Minnesota, who are here to share their stories with you. And uh, we're going we're gonna to go through this pretty quickly, as you've seen in your program. Now, I'm not going to repeat everything that's in the program. Why would I do that? I'll give you a couple of highlights. Uh, after our first round of speakers, we'll have a little bit of a break. Then we're going to get them all up here, and we want your best questions for them. Uh, and if you don't have them, I'll get them started, and they can ask each other questions. This is an incredible group of people. And then we'll have uh, Dr. Lee Carisco will come up, Ralph Weber will come up, and uh, we'll have a good lunch together. And then we get in the afternoon with the surgeons. Uh, and that, to me, was, you know, that was a big deal, uh, hearing the surgeons talk, uh, because, to me, it's easy to understand somewhat you know, how primary care or clinical care can be done. But when you get the surgeons involved, you get those huge numbers, you know, how does that work? And so I'm really excited about that. Uh, this afternoon, Twyla Braze will be with us, and then Dr. Orient is going to kind of sum everything up for us. What a wonderful uh, you know, work that she's been doing. I was on talk radio in the early 90s and interviewed her. So we've known each other for a while, and she's got a little experience in this. So. Pretty excited about that. Jeremy, thanks so much for all the work you and your wife have done uh, to make this uh, conference a success. Now, I'm going to do what MCs do after they pester people with stuff. I'm going to do a brief introduction and have Dr. Beecher come up. So, uh, Dr. Lee Beecher is the president of the Minnesota Physician Patient Alliance. It's a think tank here in Minnesota of some of the smartest people in medicine who believe in private health care. Uh, he is an office-based psychiatrist for more than 40 years, and uh, eight years ago he went to a direct pay practice. So he has a great amount of experience, of experience in this. So Dr. Beecher, come on up. You're the pay setter for the day, and uh, we'll get the conference going. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for coming. 
Um, I think uh, Dave deserves great credit in uh, organizing this, and uh, the Snavelys and AAPS and Dr. Orient uh, had a chance to say hello to her this morning. I've admired her for many years. Our Minnesota Physician Patient Alliance is 16 years old. Uh, Dr. Bob Geist and others have been instrumental in uh, stimulating thought about doctor-patient issues. Many of us uh, have participated in the Minnesota Medical Association and uh, the Twin Cities Medical Society more recently, but we realize that given the changes in demographics in the medical profession, here in Minnesota is a good example because we have 60% uh, of our physicians uh, roughly 13,000 are employed physicians, most of whom work in large groups. So as Dave showed us the maze with the uh, Affordable Care Act, uh, our colleagues who are working in employed circumstances are also facing pay for performance, guideline reviews, all kinds of things. Their employment status is oftentimes precarious and many times they are looking for a way out. Uh, so we're hoping that uh, maintaining a presence in independent practice will give them a, a, an, an exit strategy as well as a, a chance to serve the people of Minnesota. Now my talk is about direct pay psychiatric practice, which in a way is sort of the canary in the coal mine. We're a psychiatrist, we are relationship oriented, most of us, in ter at least in terms of our training. We uh, sell time, uh, even if you look at the CPT codes for our services, they're mostly time-based, so it's fairly easy for us to conceptualize a relationship and getting paid related to the amount of time or energy or relationship that we're developing or, or, uh, or uh, contributing to. <laughs> what we've evolved with, with the Minnesota Physician-Patient uh, Alliance is uh, a reliance on the patient as being the decision maker, ultimately. We've talked a lot about this in our board meetings and in our work together, but ultimately healthcare is a decision that the patient must make. Now the doctor recommends, the patient decides, it's a collaborative thing, but unless you're in a situation as Dave was where there's an emergency, uh, he still was able to get a recommendation a good one, at that it turned out to be a, a very good one for him. But that the quality of that recommendation is going to be greatly enhanced with the relationship. This is some about my practice. And eight years ago, I decided to go to direct pay because Medicare rates were so paltry that I couldn't do it. Managed care had marginalized psychiatry to medication checkers, or worse. Um, I had sort of paid my dues as a medical director in an HMO, uh, PPO situation back in the 90s, and could see that this was not quality care. Um, so now what I have is somewhat like what uh, Dave's doctor does. I have a pleasant office setting, I have a telephone, and I have access to my patient base. Um, I, I, since I'm 74, I've decided that I'm gonna keep going, so I work about 30 hours a week. And I wanna, I wanna emphasize, if you don't remember anything else about my, my little talk today, the administrative associate, how absolutely vital that person is in a solo practice as I have. Uh, many of my colleagues, young colleagues in psychiatry, and I work with the residents at the university, most of whom are female, uh, are very interested in private practice and they, they have not really considered the advantage of having somebody in the office working with them to help them maintain and uh, maintain access and relationship with their patients. So that's my main message. Uh, this administrative associate is key to the success of a solo medical practice. You don't have to have a whole roster of people, case managers and pillow fluffers and all kinds of people on the, on the payroll, but you do need one or two or three, maybe one in a solo case, that somebody you can really trust, who understands what you're doing, who's got excellent boundaries, 
who understands business and who can help and foster a good relationship with the patients. You know, in my case, uh, my, my associate is a, an educator who taught high school in business classes. She's not a nurse, she's not a social worker, but she does have the people skills. And when, when I asked her to join the practice eight years ago, uh, actually she came into the practice because the person I had thought I was going to be working with turned out to be alcohol dependent and couldn't come to work. So I called Kelly Services and said, look, I need somebody to help. And they said, um, how about this lady? She doesn't exactly fit the prototype. Her kids are growing. She wants to come back to work. She's been a teacher. And I said, have her come over. She got my, my business situation straightened out, and I realized that she was really quite bright. And I said, would you like to work in a psychiatric office? She said, I don't know anything about psychiatry. And I said, hired. <laughs> and, and that's how we got started. So she is absolutely uh, essential to making the practice work. So, of course, the, you, you, you all probably know about this because you're here, the hassles with third-party payers over reimbursement. This was what really sort of burned out my, my previous uh, associate. She was resubmitting and submitting uh, uh, forms to Blue Cross Blue Shield and the other payers, having them returned, and we, were, we weren't, we weren't uh, busy taking care of patients any longer. And I mentioned the low payments. The advantage of the direct pay is that I have no accounts receivable. And I have chosen to do it on a fee-for-service basis with contact so that I'm accountable if the patient is accountable. I don't know what Dr. Gehrig would have charged uh, Dave for his telephone consult, probably nothing but I would build that in probably those, those costs into the next visit that I had, would have. And we negotiate how many visits, what we're doing. I give the uh, patients case notes after each session so that they have a, a paper record. I do not use an electronic medical record for their actual content because of the uh, privacy and confidentiality problems with that. And that's a big issue. I hope we'll get, I think Twyla Braze will address that later today. So we, we can do quality personalized service. We can spend time with patients. We've got pro privacy and confidentiality. And of course, in psychiatry and addictions, there's stigma by the very diagnosis. So we try to eliminate that or at least mitigate it by working on what, what do you need and how are we going to do this and what's going to happen. I uh, already mentioned most of this. The third-party payer insurance which the administrative associate will help uh, the patients negotiate, goes directly to the patients. I get paid on the front end, they get paid on the back end. So they have an incentive to push the insurance company to do the right thing. We will try to provide the documentation, and again, she's essentially doing that each time they come in. So they can get in, patients can call me anytime. I went to this 24-7 availability, I put my home telephone number on my answering machine at, at work. Rarely I'm called, but when I am, there's some reason for it. And I'm able to get patients in the next day or after the weekend or whatever, or help them arrange emergency care if they need it. Uh, we have very clear office policies and procedures uh, but they are pretty much common sense, and we, we evolve them with, or we, we discuss that with every patient. Um, we always return the calls so that when we leave the office, everything has been set up properly, and the patients know what they can do next. Again, more of the same, care negotiated, collaborative review of the case notes. This is important so that I can go back because I can't remember all the detail, but I can also uh, help the patient organize what their overview is of the treatment and how we need to proceed. I mean, this sounds awfully obsessive. It's not quite that bad, but there is a, a real value in that. Patients obviously have skin in the game, as we say. Their motivation is much different. This works with patients with the full range of psychiatric disorders, including major mental illness, and their families. That's another thing. We can bring in the families, the support systems. All of that's done as part of the treatment plan. No barriers to referrals or consultations, except 
on the other side. I mean, I've got a telephone, I've got a fax machine. I, I don't do much on the email. I try not to do that because I think it's better to speak directly with the other providers if I can find them. Okay, no electronic medical records, patient notes, phone contacts are recorded, make a note, bring it in, put it in the chart, review it with the patient when they come in. Um, we will, of course, do more um, administrative things, but we only respond to specific questions. In other words, if somebody's doing a disability evaluation or whatever, I want to know what they're looking for. I'm not going to send out all of the case notes to anyone. So, did I, am I done? No. <laughs> so I think that's about it. Um, the message I want you to, to take home is that this works very well for psychiatric services. And I'm going to be uh, with, uh, learning more about how this works in primary care, internal medicine, and hopefully the surgery area. And, and some of you who are doing hospital work and are in an independent practice, I'm not sure how this will fit in terms of how you negotiate your economic uh, aspects. But it's a real pleasure to be here. I want to thank you all for attending, and we hope that you'll interact with us because that's what we're here for. <laughs> I'm being uh, invaded here. Uh, this is Jeremy, by the way, Jeremy Snavely. For those of you who don't know Jeremy, he is uh, the advance. Let's see, come behind, come alongside guy. He had, uh, just does a, a marvelous job. It's been great to work with Jeremy. Uh, thank you, Dr. Beecher. Um, we've had, uh, we had quite a time putting this together and a, a lot of fun uh, working back and forth, trying to uh, find ways to let the community know about this. So uh, thank you, Dr. Beecher, and thanks for your leadership. Um, several weeks ago, I picked up, well, I guess months ago, I picked up a newspaper and I read about uh, Dr. Wasan and I uh, was really intrigued about her practice in Osakis, Minnesota. And uh, one of the things that's neat about this conference is we're going to have such a wide variety. You know, from Marble Falls, Texas to Osakis, Minnesota, Metro, uh, everything. And, uh, and this just, I'm really looking forward to this. Okay, so I'm going to get out of the way pretty quickly. Dr. Wasan started her direct pay uh, practice in Osakis in 2002 after working in the uh, corporate medical world at Alina for a bit. Um, I noticed that uh, she says her specialty is helping people who are uh, paying out of pocket get cost effective uh, medical coverage. And that, of course, is the primary purpose for doing this. Uh, I love the last part. Your husband's a Lutheran brethren uh, pastor. Together you raise sheep. And, uh, and, and I, think that's, I think that's awesome because doctors, after all, are people too, right? And, uh, and you have your, uh, your own characteristics and your own likes, and, and the whole healthcare system is based on individuality, or it ought to be, uh, and your personality fitting into your practice. What a great thing that is. So Dr. Wasan, come and uh, share your story with us. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Susan Wasson. Sorry, Sorry, Dave. <laughs> And I made a bunch of notes, but I'm not sure I should be referring to them because they didn't give me too much time, and the story is really much too long. But uh, basically, when I was getting to the end of my residency at the University of Minnesota, I was thinking a bit about rural medicine, and the idea of practicing in a small town really appealed to me. But I felt I didn't have enough outpatient experience because in fact I had very little <laughs> outpatient experience in my residency. So I went and worked for Alina for well, I signed a two-year contract, so I knew I had to be there for two years. And during that time, I saw a lot of things that bothered me, and I was reading about health economics on the side. And the thing that bothered me the most was that there wasn't a thing I could do to help the people with no insurance. They were expected to pay this enormous bill when the third parties were only paying a percentage, and the percentage varied. At that time, what I was reading from consultants was a, it was probably around 60% of the bill that the third parties were paying. Now I can tell you, I believe it's quite a bit less in some instances. But I just felt that that was wrong. I asked my colleagues, what do you do when you have an uninsured patient? Because they tried very hard to insulate us from what anything cost. And uh, we were all paid on RVUs, you know. 
And uh, they said, well, you just under document and under code. And I'm like, well, that's fraud. <laughs> if they catch you, you're in a little trouble for that. And it wasn't good for the medical record to mess that up either. So I thought about it, and after experiencing staff that I was forced to work with who were incompetent and or dishonest, and then uh, Alina gave me a statement showing me how much they paid me in that first year relative to how much I generated, and I thought, hmm, where's all that money going? <laughs> I decided to look at doing something myself. And I realized that what the overhead costs were at that clinic were just astronomical, mostly administration, I would say, who didn't make my job any easier or do anything good for the patients. So I thought I could maybe do it better myself, and I started making lists and lists and lists, lists of what I needed, what I really needed, what I really, really needed, what I really, really, really needed, and could also afford. And that was a much shorter list, I can tell you. It was important to me not to go into debt doing this, because I figured if I had any debt, then I was going to be really tied in, and it would be very hard for me to make any changes, and I wouldn't have the flexibility that I wanted to have to do what I thought was important, which was basically to start a practice that was more of a ministry than a business, and to focus on people who didn't have insurance or who had lousy insurance. And I did my re research, because the state of Minnesota has got statistics online, I'm sure other states do too, where they tell you by county what the insurance rate is, and uh, what the poverty rate is, and all of this. And I wound up in Todd County, partly because I had relatives and friends in the area, so I had contacts, but I knew that they had about the highest rate of uninsurance in the state of Minnesota, which was 11%. It's been that very consistently over the last decade. And additionally, I also knew from my personal connections that a lot of people who had insurance had crummy insurance, 60-40 if you work for one of the big meatpacking plants, and a lot of people had ten to $15,000 deductibles. That's like not having insurance. And it really stunk that... Uh, the people who didn't have insurance, too, were, were hit with this big bill when, you know, the blues were only paying a percentage. So I decided that uh, I could make a go of it if I kept my costs in line. So I did a lot, of, a lot of shopping around. It took me about a year to get things set up. I bought equipment on eBay because it was cheaper then. Sometimes it still is. You have to really watch, though. And uh, narrowed down the services that I could provide to what I thought I could keep, so I could keep the office visit affordable. I confess that I did take Medicare for the first three years, mostly just as a service to the seniors in the area, until they started making me resubmit all my claims due to clerical errors on their part, and they were paying me $12 an office visit, but the, when everyone else was paying 40 or 50. And I thought that was wrong, because the uninsured people should not be subsidizing the third-party payers. But the other issue with Medicare, this was really the last straw, was when I got a check from a, from a supplement company for 57 cents. <laughs> I thought, well, if that's not administrative waste, I don't know what is. So then I opted out completely. But uh, what I think the key thing is to succeeding in a rural practice, solo, starting from scratch where you don't know anybody, is uh, first of all, you have to be cheap. Because what kind of competition are you if you provide the same services as everybody else and you charge the same fee, only the difference is you expect people to pay you out of pocket? That doesn't even make sense. So you, you have to be cheap. That's what gets people in the door. It is a good experience that keeps them coming back. And so in my case, I went out of my way to really customize things. I shamelessly promoted myself as the country doctor. I carried business cards everywhere. I handed them out to everybody. I give people free advice with a smile because even if they never come see you, they'll tell their friends about you. They'll tell their relatives about you. And in a rural practice, people don't come to see you, except for the very bold, unless they have heard from somebody they know that you are okay. So it takes quite a long time to get established, especially if you're not the only gay man in the area. And in my case, you know, it took years to build it, but I confess that part of the problem with that was that uh, I situated my office in my home to save money, and it was off a gravel road out in the boondocks <laughs> because it saved on zoning regulations, but uh, also because I didn't want drunken customers appearing on my doorstep at 2 a.m. back when I was single. Now I wouldn't worry about it, and in fact, I would have put my office on the edge of town and taken care of the zoning stuff, and I would have just bought a double barrel shotgun. But uh, <laughs> at, at the time, I was a, a little fearful of that. But uh, I got married about, I guess it was three years in, and uh, the last straw for keeping the office in the country was when my husband caught me hiding under the knee hole of my desk because there were Mexican gangsters walking around the house, pounding on the windows after hours trying to get me to open up. 
I supplemented my income in those early days when I got the, the contract for the Todd County Detention Center. So I was doing jail health on the side, which was kind of fun. I had to give it up after a while because, for one thing, the malpractice insurance that I had to have to keep that job was eating up two-thirds of what I was being paid. And it was too much work for that. Plus, I was getting too busy. When I moved my office to town, that made a big difference. But a lot of the folks I see don't go to the doctor regularly. So I was very surprised when my local colleagues were more than a bit hostile. The, I expected a collegial relationship. I thought, I'm fixing a problem for you. You know, I'll take care of the uninsured people. You can have all the ones with good co coverage. We both win. Well, apparently there's a turf war going on, and I'm in the middle of it, and I didn't know. It's a little better now. But uh, anyway, that I didn't expect. But I can tell you, it's a very different, different way to practice. In the cities, I would have liked to have had relationships with my patients over the long haul so that I got to know more about them, sort of like Dave's experience. But uh, the third party payers determined where people went and every so often they'd end up changing to a totally different health system because of that. And I found that very frustrating. And also, you know, as a female internist in the Twin Cities, this is what my daily schedule looked like. Complete physical, birth control, complete physical, PAP, menopause, 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 hypothyroidism, high blood pressure. That was it, it, it wasn't very exciting. Although it was a good experience, but when you go out to the country, you never know what's going to come in through the door. And I can tell you very crazy stories if you want to hear them. <laughs> but uh, it's a nice challenge. The other thing is when I was in medical school, I had a wonderful mentor there, uh, Harry Maisel, who was the chief of the anatomy department, and he had a little family practice on the side. Harry is originally from South Africa, and he practiced medicine in the ghettos back when there was still uh, apartheid and left in frustration with apartheid. And he took me on house calls with him when I was in medical school in inner city Detroit. Went in neighborhoods I would never have dared to set foot otherwise. He refused to lock the car. He had a pile of change in the console and a nice sport coat in the back seat. And he said, no, don't lock the car because if you lock it, you know, then they'll think it's fair game. And if you leave it unlocked, they think there's a trick. <laughs> I should have learned that sooner because I had to replace glass in my car three times during the four years that I was in Detroit in medical school. <laughs> Anyway, but he took me on house calls and it, it showed me a totally different side of relating to people. And it made me realize that what you see in the hospital is such a tiny sliver of what that person's life is like that you have to be real careful. For one thing, there's no point in prescribing something that people will never do because they can't afford it, because they have some bias against it, because it's too inconvenient, whatever. So, you know, in my practice, I'm sorry to say, whatever the academic gold standard is, usually goes out the window. People who aren't insured will refuse to go to the hospital. And I, when I was up there my first few years, you know, I, I had pretty definite ideas about how I thought things ought to be done. And someone would come in with an infection, I'd say, you really ought to have IV antibiotics. Let me put you in the hospital. Nope, not going. Why not? Well, it's too much money. I can't afford it. I said, but this is serious. You know, we should really take care of this. And, and they'd say, oh, just give me some pills, doc. I'll be fine. Oh, just give me some pills, doc. I'll be fine. I heard it over and over. And you know what? Everybody was. <laughs> So now I don't have any privileges because I never used them. I send a few people to, uh, well, when, when you really need a hospital, I generally advise you to go someplace where they have specialists in-house. The exception is like a routine gallbladder or cholecystectomy or, or an appendectomy or something like that, or some of the orthopedic things get done locally pretty well. But generally, infections, that's stuff I can manage at home because I make house calls. I don't make as many now as I used to because they take a lot of time. But that was one of the ways that I differentiated myself from everybody else when I first started out was that I'd go to anybody's house. And uh, I tried to limit the hours a bit and I wound up failing miserably because I desperately needed the cash. <laughs> and now I limit them because I have a three-year-old daughter at home and that's more important to me than being in the office all day forever. Um, I've always thought that call was generally a stupid waste of time the kind that I had to do at Alina, which was every fifth night. And uh, in two and a half years of call, I only had one person call where it was a genuine emergency. Everybody else figured out that if you waited until 501, that the answering system would put you straight through to a doctor, and then you didn't have to talk to the nurse. Or they were calling because they wanted refills on either antibiotics or controlled substances. And it was kind of the same people who called all the time. After a while, you got to recognize the names. So I don't do call, but I do give out my cell phone number. I'm a little judicious about it. I'm, I don't give it to absolutely everybody. 
until I have a relationship with you and I'm confident that you won't abuse it, I don't give it out. But I do tell people that they're capable of determining what is an emergency. If you can't see straight, if you can't breathe, if you're bleeding to death, if something doesn't move like it's supposed to, if you have the worst headache of your life, you know, you go in. Those things I think are pretty obvious. Or if someone finds you unconscious. Don't call me, don't waste time, you go to the ER. And my patients so far have proven to me that they are very good at making those judgment calls about what is really an emergency and what isn't. And the thing about uninsured people that I think it's underestimated in a lot of what you hear is that this population, they tell me routinely, I can't afford to be sick. I'm here today, maybe it's not that bad, but I just can't afford to get sick. They often come in a little earlier than the people who have got health care coverage because they want to be sure they take care of things. They take their health a lot more seriously in terms of preventive things. I've had way more uninsured people willing to quit smoking than those who have coverage. It's a, it's a very interesting thing. The other thing I, I have to tell you, it's a beautiful thing being in solo practice or private practice because your thoughts become your own when you are not being told, follow this guideline, do this quality improvement, do that, do this, and you start to think for yourself. Because a lot of these guidelines that we are having thrust upon us are just based on somebody's opinion. And when you go back and you take the time to actually look at the medical literature, Sometimes it's really kind of appalling. I never quote anybody relative risk anymore because I think it's a useless kind of data. I always quote the absolute risk. And I have the time now to go look at the methods in the journal article and not just read the conclusion so that I can be sure I'm giving people information that I think is really accurate. And I don't push people to do things if there's only one study showing that it's effective. I like to see more than one. That's how science is supposed to work. You're supposed to prove it in multiple settings that things are effective before you foist them on everybody. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of our guidelines are based on a single study that no one has ever repeated for verification. I'll tell you a few other things, tips that I have for succeeding if you're going to start a practice on your own, especially in a small area. A larger-than-life personality really helps. So, this is my uniform. I, I don't wear the blazer in the office. That's too formal. That's too formal. I always wear the white coat on house calls. It's got my name on it, so everybody sees who I am. This is very important, you need to be seen. But I don't spend money on advertising. I've done it a couple times, mostly just to inform people, like when I moved my office to town, and one time I had to change the phone number a bit. When I've done things like that, then I've taken out an ad. And that's mostly to support the small town newspapers who have been so incredibly generous with me. I made the front page in all the little papers when I opened my practice. That was invaluable advertising. You can't buy that. It's tremendous. And so you, you, have your, you have your persona, and then you need to make your office look, some, look so, like some place that people want to go to. I never understood why they made a line of clinics so incredibly ugly. I never got that. I mean, what is with the off-white walls and the ugly, dirty carpet, and then they got all this, like, aqua blue and mauve every place. It was very unappealing. The art on the walls was hideous. There was nothing in there to make anybody feel at home. Nothing to make you feel like you could trust the people that you were dealing with. It's all there just to overwhelm you so you don't ask too many questions, is how I see it. Same thing with the big atria that Dave mentioned. That's not to make anybody feel at home. That's to shut you up and tell you not to ask questions. Bow down to the gods of medicine is how I see it. So my, my office is very different. I have a play area. I refuse to remove the toys. They're all things that can be hosed down with disinfectant from time to time, which we do. And I have actual paintings on the walls that I think are kind of pretty. And uh, I try very hard to make it look homey. Every so often, the chairs in my waiting room, none of which match, tend to fall apart because they come from garage sales. So I replace them about every three to four years, and it costs me a total of $15 usually, maybe 20 if I'm feeling a little extravagant. My office, you can, you can see it in the background in that picture of me and your stuff there. It's quite cluttered. And... Uh, I got books all over the place, and yeah, I have my diplomas all hanging up on the one wall, but it's not the wall that patients are looking at. And I have some nice art in there, you know, oil paintings, which you can get pretty cheaply in any antique store, and one of them I got at a yard sale for $3. And the, the thing is, you know, make it look like a place you want to be. Make it look like a place the patient is going to feel at home. Give them a different experience. Another thing is, people who come to see me, if they make their appointment ahead of time, they get half an hour. That's just automatic. If they don't need it, fine. i got more than enough things I can do on the side. But they get half an hour. Same-day appointments get 15 minutes. 
And that's because we figured the convenience of being seen on the same day ought to net me some benefit. So that's how it works. It's $50 for an office visit. I haven't changed that rate for years. I did have to hike up the commercial driver physicals, though. They're 75 now, and that's just because I'm going to have to jump through a lot of hoops to get certified by the feds to keep doing them. But I see a lot of truck drivers. Most of the people I see are employed. A lot of them have got more than one job. Most of them have no benefits. The ones who do have benefits, some of them have actually quite good insurance, and they're just not happy going anywhere else, so they come back to see me. And I have quite a few people with Medicare that see me, and I'm usually not their main primary care person, with a few exceptions, but uh, they like to get my opinion. Maybe they go somewhere else and they just don't feel like they were heard, they show up in my office a week or two later for, for another approach. So uh, that's it in a nutshell, I guess. I'm very, very happy, in case you can't tell. She'd be much happier if I got her name right, of course, but uh, that's, uh, that's terrific. That, uh, that, to me, is what this whole conference is about, is to hear how uh, different settings, different towns, different character all fits into your practice. You know, she said happy, uh, and that... That's something I know Dr. Gehrig says all the time, I'm so happy, I'm having such a good time being a doctor. I don't know that that's common in your practice anymore. Um, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Foley, I met through uh, the Minnesota Physician-Patient Alliance. Um, he uh, is, is one of the uh, fellows who likes to express his opinion now and then, and, uh, and it's very articulate. Um, and his practice has evolved in a different way, uh, taken on a different emphasis, uh, which I know he's going to share with you. Uh, he is um, now involved in the Minnesota Natural Medicine uh, Collaborative Practice, involving the practice of integrative medicine, compounding pharmacy, and functional health. Dr. Foley, come on up and share your experience. Thanks, David. You bet. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I want to thank uh, David and Jeremy and uh, Dr. Orient for all the work that it takes to put something like this together. And your organization is something that's uh, very close to my heart. They helped me out a lot when I started this journey. I wanted to, yeah, this is a slide from 1997. I just wanted to spend a couple minutes showing you what my navigation was to get where I was. And by the way, Susan. I mean, that's a warrior. That's a medical warrior. I mean, I just can't say enough about how much I enjoy listening to that, because that's the basics. Um, this is going to be a little bit uh, sort of a snobby intellectual thing, you know, but uh, compared to her. Um, but uh, what happened to me is in the early 90s, I started looking at problem cases, Lyme disease, things like that. I got very dissatisfied with the way things were working, functioning. Um, a, a good friend of mine, a guy named Jeff Bland, who started the Institute of Functional Medicine, actually I had played handball against him in a national handball tournament in 1970, and uh, I had uh, maintained my relationship with him, and he started this whole thing with uh, supplements, molecular biology, and things like that, and I started with the internet exchanging an email with these people, and I got very much into this stuff, and <clears throat> so where I formerly worked, I... Uh, tried to establish a Department of Integrative Medicine, Functional Medicine, and it was a struggle, as you might know. Um, I moved away from fee-for-service medicine, uh, or I should say institutional conventional medicine, not so much because of money, not, it was not because of the politics. I was very politically embedded uh, in everything that you, know, you needed to be uh, successful in that organization. It was really an intellectual vacuum for me. I just was very dissatisfied with the one disease, one drug, uh, nice little snippets of time, coding, uh, algorithmic medicine. It got very dissatisfying. I wanted to help with why people got sick. And as the internet developed and people like me started talking to each other, and a couple of them are in this room, Greg Plotnikoff and uh, other people around the country, we found there was another side to medicine. So anyway, this is a slide from 1997. I was actually giving to the administration at in an effort to establish a Department of Integrative Functional Medicine. And I just wanted you to um, see, let's see, spacebar? Uh, it's not advancing. Enter, try that. There we go. So this is what I 
I was trying to lay a new frontier for medicine, and, and without getting into it, this is the stuff that I talked about to these people, that uh, medicine needed to become an upstream um, institution, that we had to preempt disease. Uh, I tried to teach the administration and the people in the healthcare system about the concept of compressing morbidity. Um, I wanted them to understand that if we understood and studied the genetics, the environmental influences, diet and lifestyle of patients, we could actually reduce demand for disease management. And uh, this was a concept that actually was quite appealing until they realized that this was going to reduce the number of people that went through a cath lab. So, as you can see, my, my evangelical approach to trying to change the approach to medicine in my institution initially was met with intellectual curiosity, but eventually was met with, I'm not sure we want to go here. So as, as I tried to discuss these concepts with them, I became a bit of an adversary within my own institution. So anyway, uh, again, key concepts focusing on genes, diet lifestyle modifications, uh, functional medicine principles of biochemical individuality, I think I was one of the first people to use the uh, concept of patient-centered delivery, where the focus is on the individuals, not the disease. Uh, understanding the web-like interconnectedness between various biologic functions, uh, promotion of organ reserve, et cetera. So here's where my mind went. Uh, patient-oriented healthcare really involved uh, understanding the patient rather than the, the disease endpoint and understanding people's uniquenesses. Uh, it also involved re-engineering the way we delivered care. Restoring patient autonomy became very important, and this was something I didn't think that we delivered very well. Uh, the patient is actually a co-arbiter of decision-making. Many physicians, particularly when you're in a managed care hierarchy, that doesn't work out too well because the managed care system, the third party, is actually the arbiter of what happens re-engineering the way it's delivered. So in other words, patients as customers and clients, uh, the patient is more important before the disease emerges. And then I got down to the point, and this is over several years, that the, I realized that the patients, uh, I'm sorry, the payer was making decisions at all levels of acuity, and they really should only be making decisions at very high levels of acuity. Um, I started doing group visits. That didn't play too well because I was using the conference room up every day with patients uh, who would come and bring their lunches, and I would give a talk about some functional aspect of some disease. So, you know, we'd have multiple sclerosis day, we'd have Crohn's disease day, et cetera, and we'd have 16, 20, 30 patients in there, and I was always taking up the conference room. And finally I got told, you know what, this is a conference room. You can't have patients in here. You know, it's like uh, Dr. Strangelove, you know, don't you understand this is a war room? Anyway, so, uh, so in other words, I became more and more conflicted. So I want to zoom ahead, and this is the facts actually I got yesterday from Medica. Dr. Foley, please consider the following healthcare management opportunities that we have identified from claims records for your patient, Mr. So-and-so. Our records suggest that your patient may be a non-adherent with his or her prescribed statin. The message is triggered when the calculated compliance is below 70%. If you haven't already done so and it's appropriate, please discuss the importance of taking this medication with your patient. To which I will show you in a minute, we're very high tech in our place. It took me about 30 seconds to send the following back. Happy to review, please indicate that you're willing to pay our usual fee for the administrative time of $375 per hour by returning this page with your signature. Thanks. <laughs> That's a little microcosm of how I deal with some of these people. Anyway, Minnesota Natural Medicine, I left in 2001. We opened our doors on September 11th, 2001. Um, we didn't know whether that was a harbinger, but we did watch TV the whole first day. And my father-in-law was the only patient that came in that day, bless his heart. Um, I rented two rooms from a chiropractor. I was violating a non-compete that got a little contentious, but I did tell them that uh, I invited them to please sue me because I thought that being on page B in the Pioneer Press would be great publicity. 
So the first 18 months were pretty thin. I had three kids in college. Um, and by the way, I couldn't have done this without my wife, Janet, who really would live in a tent if we had to. So um, we've now grown to three practitioners plus myself. I have two part-time receptionists, uh, two med techs. Um, I charge $375 an hour no matter what it is that I do. I do generally 90% free email. Everybody has email access to me. I do a lot of email. If it gets to the point where I have to document something in a chart, my meter runs. If I talk on the phone and it needs documentation, the meter runs. They have to sign policies and procedures that indicate they agree to this. Uh, and my nurse practitioner, naturopath, acupuncturist, this is what we charge. The major elements of my cash clinic are following. First and foremost, policies and procedures are very important. Patients have to sign a very detailed waiver, understanding, including at the top if they're Medicare age and Medicare opt-out. I define my scope of practice and my standard of care, which is a little broader than what would otherwise be considered the general conventional standard of care. I tell them what the deliverables are. Uh, tell them about call, communications, acute care. And much like Susan, I do the same thing. I, I gave away my hospital privileges five years ago. I never used it. If somebody's really sick, um, I tell them, you got to go to the hospital. They're going to take care of you anyway. I do not advertise myself as a primary care physician, but as a consultant. Uh, but I tell them, you know, if insurance is important, if you have to have a foot in the primary care area, please have a primary care physician in your insurance grid. Uh, but, um, but I'm generally available seven days a week, night and day. Um, do you have to have a credit card on file? We do have some non-FaceTime charges they have to agree to, phone consults, certain email, administrative uh, fees. Uh, we have a no-show policy. You gotta let us know two business days ahead of time other than emergencies that um, you, if you electively just don't show up, uh, I think we give you one hall pass after that, we charge you. Uh, I do charge for case research and record review. We get some very difficult cases. People come into our office that have charts this high. They've been basically sent out to pasture by Mayo, Hennepin, private people, a lot of Lyme disease, a lot of uh, chronic fatigue, things like that. And I do charge them, although very humbly and usually undercharge them, but I do charge for case research and record review. Um, we have follow-up and refill policies that are very specific. I do have an electronic medical record. I had one of the first ones. Uh, it's a very inexpensive one called Soapware. It works very well. It's very turnkey. I think to get into Soapware now, it'll probably be five or $6,000, but they walk you completely through the portal. It's very easy to do. It's very customizable. The reason I have it is because I can work from anywhere. I have an encrypted terminal server, um, so I can be, you know, sitting at my son's in Washington, D.C., uh, in his living room, and I can be doing patient care. Um, I do voice activated dictation. I dictate all my notes right in front of the patient at the time of service. They got a copy of everything at every visit. And we tell them, you have a running tally of your entire medical record, lab sheets, doctor stuff, uh, uh, my notes, everything. So if you call here and you ask us to copy something or if some consultant asks for a copy of my records, there's going to be a charge for it because you already have the copy. Uh, I do email. Um, I might do it a little too much, but the reason I like it is because people know that I'm always there. You don't always have to say you know what's going on or you have a good answer, but just sometimes that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Let's talk about it next week or something like that. Uh, patients really appreciate the fact that you're out there. Payment is at the time of service. Um, we rarely send any invoices out. Uh, we do invoice third-party payers and pharmacies for administrative fees. You know what? They don't always pay, but I'll tell you what is when they, when they get the first invoice from us and we turn them over to I have turned Alina over to a collection agency. Uh, then it's interesting, all of a sudden, some of the hassles stop. So it works. Again, I have a, our server is private and protected. We are not in anybody's cloud. So uh, we have multiple backups. I have a terminal server, so um, all of my practitioners can work from home. Uh, you, 100 people could be working on our record at one time. You could be a faculty member of Minnesota Natural Medicine. I've got a couple of consultants from other states that work for Minnesota Natural Medicine. 
um, and they, they log in, they chart, et cetera, but they are not engaged directly in patient care. They are consulting me. So they're not practicing in Minnesota without a license. They review the case. They tell me what their suggestion is, but they don't directly involve themselves with patient care. I'm the one that deploys that. So they don't have to have a license to practice in Minnesota. But this way, in the new world of virtual medicine, for example, if there's a, an uh, expert that knows more than anybody else about uh, certain types of pain in San Francisco, which we have, he can consult on a patient in my office using our platform. Uh, we usually do a cyber consult. Patient comes in. We do a vo uh, phone conference. Next year, we'll be able to do a visual, virtual conference with that individual. Um, he reviews the case. Uh, I pay him. He charges me. And then I charge the patient. Um, we remind patients that if they do submit our records, uh, and we code, we try to use that silly code uh, that the AMA owns, um, but once they get reimbursement, uh, then uh, that third party has access, they have a right to the records. So we tell them, you know, it's no ticky, no surety here. The thir third party payer, if they are involved with the transaction, that patient has signed off the right to have privacy to those records. So. We don't give anybody any records. The patient has to give them. Uh, and of course, I think the AMA codes are a real obstacle. Um, you know, I liken today's healthcare is to Chicago during Prohibition. Um, Minnesota's very much like that. You've got the north side, the south side, the west side. You have health partners, United Healthcare, Blue Cross Blue Shield, soon fewer. They all divide the town up. Uh, and if you don't speak Sicilian, you can't sell booze. That's what it's like with the codes. You have to talk their language. The lessons, make sure your opt-out is done well with an attorney. We use a courier every time to hand it to the administrator for our opt-out. There have been some disasters for people that say they didn't get it, and then you're automatically back in. Um, remember, patients have to sign every year you opt out. I'm sure most of you know that, but uh, they do. Uh, we are in the ninth month of an IRS audit, randomly selected. Uh, so be careful of that. We have got, been audited every year by the Department of Revenue by Minnesota, uh, State of Minnesota for one thing or another. Um, that's odd. I've got a great relationship with the Board of Medical Practice because we try to do everything right. And I thought you want, want to see a picture of our office. No, that's not really. Anyway, but he has been looking after us. Anyway, that's a picture of our office, Minnesota Natural Medicine. That's my email. Any of you are welcome to talk with me if I can be a resource to you in any way to help you logistically in doing this, I'm happy to do so. Terrific. Um, I was thinking as you were talking about the responsibility of the patient, and I'm hearing this, come through in the, the case study. Uh, when I walked into Dr. Gehrig's office the first time, I make my living as a writing, or as a writer, so I brought my case study. It was about that thick, and I wrote it. <laughs> I said, I want you to know me from top to bottom, and literally I walked him through my entire body. Uh, and I don't know if that's a common practice with your patients. Uh, maybe I could go into business writing health histories for patients in cash practice. This is called filling time, by the way. So uh, before we introduce Dr. Ilkama, which I think I'll start doing. Uh, Dr. Ilkama and I met, um, boy, I think it was maybe two years ago. Uh, we were invited to speak at a small business group conference together. And I was supposed to talk about the Affordable Care Act. And he was going to talk about you know, his practice. and. Um, I told the truth that day about the Affordable Care Act, and I got in trouble with the event sponsor because they didn't want to hear the truth. They wanted to hear all the great benefits they were going to get from it. And uh, Dr. Ilkama, I think we agreed that the whole response that we got was not the best. Uh, and so we're really excited to have him with us here today to talk to you all about his practice. Um, he uh, says here, training experience of 28 years of primary care, he decided to establish his own practice with a focus on clinical medicine. And I think it's just been a couple of years now, uh, if I've got that right. So please welcome Dr. James Ilkema.
Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, let me first say that I'm a proud member of AAPS. This is a very good resource if you want to opt out of Medicare, which I did four years ago. Uh, after residency, I spent uh, 10 years in Iowa, three different practice opportunities, uh, during which I had time to observe and um, take the good points of practice and uh, reject the bad points of practice. In 1990, I moved up to uh, Minnesota and worked for a uh, big box clinic for 18 years. Uh, we would have monthly meetings, and at these meetings, uh, we didn't discuss um, medicine so much as finances. Uh, there were fights about money, okay? And my take on it was, we don't have to decide uh, how to better slice up the pie, we have to decide how to make the pie bigger. Uh, we didn't have to work harder, we had to work, work smarter. And uh, that's all I remember from those, from those days, the monthly meetings and the monthly fights. Uh, I was around when HMOs hit the scene. And uh, my wife was also a physician, and I decided early on that HMOs, that business model was unsustainable, and history has shown that it is indeed unsustainable. Uh, they've changed the initials, HMOs are now ACOs, and they again will be unsustainable and will collapse. So when I was at this big box clinic, um, there were some moves by the insurance companies to improve the quality of care, quality initiatives they were called. And uh, these came down uh, with the best of intentions, the best. Um, one thing I remember is they wanted to uh, check all women 18 to 26 uh, for chlamydia. Fine, great idea. Except when you get to that uh, woman who's uh, getting her college physical and she's a virgin and you're supposed to check her for an STD. Well, if she's private pay, her parents get that bill, there's a line item entry, what's this? you've got no answer for that dad who saw his virgin daughter get checked for an STD. Well, that was one of the many things that frosted me. I figured there had to be a better way. Um, there was another case I remember very well. Uh, this um, single mom, waitress, minimum wage, gets a call from daycare. Her kid has pink eye. Kid's gotta be seen, kid's gotta be treated, or kid won't go back to daycare. So I see her write the prescription for drops, big deal, $160. And I figured there had to be a better way. So uh, I started thinking about this a little more, and I figured uh, I could do this if I had the right niche. And uh, my niche was low overhead. I've got a small uh, two-room uh, practice in uh, Burnsville, a small reception area. I've got one staffer. She uh, answers the phone, makes appointments, uh, takes the money, does some typing. Uh, I also do house calls. And uh, my house call patients really appreciate it because they can't get a Medicare doc to go out there. Medicare docs, by and large, don't do house calls because they don't pay. Uh, when I do a house call, by the way, I get um, uh, the patient agreement signed and I get the money up front, and then I uh, do my thing at the house call. Uh, my dictations, I don't pay a transcription service. Uh, I use Dragon, it's a great program. Uh, it types what you say. It's like Star Trek, 1916. <laughs> uh, I've got one staffer, as I said. Uh, I don't do any uh, blood draw in the office. Uh, I found a lab, it's called Request to Test. It's a cash lab, most profiles are $29, which is a lot cheaper than the hospital. Uh, X-rays are done next door. Uh, chest and extremity films are between $50 and $100. That's as much information as I can get out of the X-ray people. Uh, there's a MRI facility in Woodbury 
that will do a non-contrast MRI for $500, uh, which is a lot cheaper than uh, the commercial imaging places. Uh, I have a medical record. Uh, it's called Practice Fusion. Uh, it works very well. Uh, it's on the cloud. I don't mind things being on the cloud. Uh, my financial uh, books, QuickBooks, that's also on the cloud. Uh, but the best thing about Practice Fusion is that it's F-R-E-E-E -E -E free. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Anyone have Practice Fusion? You, you enjoy it? Yeah, it's great. Good. Uh, opened my practice June 1st, 2009, and uh, my first month I saw 17 patients. Well, this week, I'm pleased to report, I've seen 17 patients per day. Uh, first year, didn't go so well with marketing. They didn't teach us that in medical school. Uh, I sent out a mass mailing. I got back exactly zero responses. Well, I did get three back, uh, moved, no forwarding address. <laughs> uh, I got a tip from a golf partner of mine to visit uh, pharmacies and minute clinics uh, and urgent cares. Now, if you hang around a pharmacy uh, for more than a few minutes and you'll overhear a patient talking to a pharmacist, you realize that pharmacists practice a hell of a lot of medicine. Uh, by and large, they do a pretty good job, and uh, I hope they know when they're in over their head. So I would go around to the neighborhood pharmacies, give them my card, give them my flyer, say, um, I know you practice medicine when you're in over your head. Uh, send the patient to me, here's the address. Uh, $55 for a one problem visit, uh, $80 and up for a two problem visit. Uh, strictly cash, no checks. I do have a uh, credit card machine. Discover Visa Card Master. I don't take American Express. And I think you all know why I don't take American Express. Uh, about six months in to the practice, uh, the Star Tribune heard about me. And I was pleased to report a Sunday paper front page article. <laughs> Now, it was below the fold, but I'll still take Star Tribune Sunday front page coverage. Uh, that doubled my uh, patient traffic. A uh, few weeks after that, uh, ABC News heard about that, and I had my uh, two minutes and 15 seconds of fame on uh, ABC World News Tonight. They did a nice uh, video, nice interview, and it went uh, national. We had calls from relatives in... Uh, uh, Arizona and California. Uh, getting back to that first crummy year of marketing, uh, did have a website, timewisemedical.com, and there's a uh, process called search engine optimization. And I tried to work with that, but uh, being the age I am, I'm not naturally deft with computers. I think uh, search engine optimization is now on the ash heap of history, and there's other ways that search engines uh, uh, look for you. Um, in terms of patients, uh, it's a lot of word of mouth now. It's nice and cheap. It's slow, but it's cheap. And I like the freedom of charging uh, whatever I want to charge. Uh, for instance, drain an abscess. Um, there's a $100 charge for that but subsequent visits to change the dressing, there are no charge, and I'm pleased to do that. I couldn't do that at the big box clinic. I had to charge for the initial visit and for the subsequent visits, and that, that frosted me too. Um, I, I do use email with my patients. Uh, it works very well. Uh, in terms of refills, uh, there's a service I offer, refills over the phone, established patients only. I charge a full office call for that. And so far, no one's objected. They appreciate it, especially when some of my patients are in Maple Grove. I've got some patients come down from Duluth, Grand Rapids, uh, Belle Plaine, Mankato. Uh, I've got, I've got uh, I think I've got a patient coming from Iowa. Uh, in terms of call, 
the uh, office phone rolls over to my cell phone. Uh, there's a handful of calls, maybe between five and seven. But uh, in four years, I think I've gotten about 12 calls that wake me up, and about half of those were wrong numbers. <laughs> um, when I do take vacation, I uh, have a Dr. Kumar, who is also in social practice, or uh, solo practice in Bloomington. She, however, is um, uh, hooked up with the insurance companies. She, I haven't quite been able to persuade her to go to a uh, cash practice, but I'm gonna ask her one more time. So I do take time off. Uh, Dr. Kumar covers for me, I uh, then cover for her. And uh, I tell you, this time off business, uh, sure beats going to the medical director or the CEO and saying, can I have this week off? When I enter into negotiations with the medical director, they typically go rather well uh, in terms of time <laughs> off for me. So uh, feel free to visit my uh, website, timewisemedical.com. Uh, I, uh, after that first rough year, uh, things started to roll, and uh, I look forward to going to the office every day. I see new patients every day. Uh, I've got a lot of uh, repeat customers, and uh, I'm very happy at the end of the day. Excellent. Thank you, sir. So what did I write down? Oh, word of mouth. How important is word of mouth uh, to the practice, the solo practice? How many of you think that I've sent any patients to Dr. Garrick? <laughs> oh my, my, of course I do. Uh, when you get that kind of service and that kind of relationship, it's pretty exciting and you want everybody to know about it. It's easy to become a missionary. Um, I'm going to fill a little more time, right? Here we go. Okay. Uh, just. Several days ago, uh, I do talk radio, and I do a show called Your Life Matters. And so um, every day that I'm on the air, I'm looking for articles, things about health care reform. And lo and behold, I checked my Wall Street Journal, and there was Dr. Madrigal. <laughs> I said, wow, this is pretty darn cool. Uh, and here she is, just uh, ready to come to uh, St. Paul and talk to us. I heard uh, Dr. Madrigal's presentation. In fact, I have to say in a little bit, this conference is somewhat inspired by this because uh, I, was, I was really moved by what I heard in Las Vegas when you shared, but, I mean, when all of them shared, but when you shared, because out of Marble Falls, Texas, uh, a town that's probably just a little bigger than Minneapolis, um, we are able to find this very, very successful medical practice. And I, I think you're in for a real treat to hear how it's done uh, out of Texas, she doesn't have her boots on, but I will tell you this, we're sitting here and she gets a call uh, about someone with a snake bite. Copperhead. Yeah, Copperhead. That doesn't happen real often here in the Twin Cities, but uh, welcome uh, Dr. Madrigal, please. Thank you for having me. Jeremy, do I just hit, how do I make it go forward? Thank you for having me here. We're at 70 something degrees. When I left, it was 104. <laughs> so that patient with a copperhead bite, I text her back. I said, I'll call you in a little bit. I mean, she's in the hospital. She just wants to be double checked that they're doing everything right. And I said, by the way, it's 74 degrees here. She texts me back, whatever. <laughs> so, that one's okay, cool. so um, I'm going to talk about how to start a, a cash-based practice. I've been doing this for 11 years now. I started out. <laughs> I started out not taking any insurance. I actually have a degree in advertising. That was my first life. And um, when I looked at all the contracts that I was supposed to sign, it just didn't make any sense to me at all. When I saw the ones for Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Humana, and I read the rates and how the rates were gonna change and that I didn't have any say in this contract, I just didn't even wanna do it in the first place. So I've never taken insurance. Um, I did take Medicare because I was automatically in that program and um, I don't do that anymore either and I'm really glad I don't do that. So my idea was just to take money in keep my overhead low and make money and take good care of people. And it's worked extremely well. Definitely worked by the just keep it simple practice. 
The reason I did it is because when I worked in, when I was in residency and when I worked in the emergency room, I always felt like I didn't have enough time for patients. I always felt like I was missing something if I was in a time crunch to see a certain amount of people in a certain amount of time to make a certain amount of money for a certain amount of an organization. Um, there was way too much paperwork. Um, there was always decreasing pay. The pay scale kept going down, 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 and the workload went up, up, up. Um, Medicare keeps dropping its pay, and then the insurance companies match what Medicare does. Again, none of these made sense to me just from a um, purely marketing standpoint. And I didn't want the government or someone else to decide what my value was. I wanted the patients to decide what, and I wanted to decide what I needed to be paid. I also had a huge fear when the other speakers talked about fraud. I had a big fear of losing my livelihood if I made an honest mistake. If I charged a level four instead of a level three, I was really afraid I'd get audited and not be able to take care of my family. Um, I always felt like I was fudging on the ICD-9 codes to try to get a test ordered or a scan because you can't put rule out brain tumor. So you have to put something that they'll pay for, but you don't know yet until you have the scam. So I never felt comfortable doing that. Um, I also wanted to be able to see people for free. If you take Medicare, it's actually a felony to see people for free. And that was a big part of who I was, was seeing people who needed me for free. And I really did not want to not be able to do that or to have to do it illegally. Um, I also didn't want to live by the dictates of other people that had nothing to do with patient care. When I look at some of these codes and numbers, it makes absolutely no sense when it comes to actual real patients, and I didn't want to have to go by what some bureaucrat thought a patient's six-digit number should be instead of what I thought they had as a doctor. As you know, I think this is probably going to be a new, um, improved way the government's going to get more money in. I think it's an easy, we're easy targets, and I don't want to even be on that target. When I got rid of Medicare and by not taking insurance, um, right away I could have fewer staff. When I first started, I just had two. I had a nurse and an office manager. Now I have three. I have a nurse, an office manager, and an assistant. Um, I had no wasted time on the phone, doing prior authorizations, resubmitting and resubmitting claims, no problem with coding at all, zero accounts receivable. At the end of the day, I see how much we charged, I see how much we got in, that much goes home. That's it. <laughs> there, and all my time was spent on the patient. There wasn't a lot of time spent taking care of insurance companies or government paperwork or things other than just the patient. Um, one of the things like uh, we talked about earlier is that for us, we are in the dark. We're not supposed to talk about money. When doctors talk about money, it's really taboo. We get zero to no business education. Um, we can't legally compare charges. It's actually, actually against the law for me to ask the guy down the street what he's charging. Um, that's considered price fixing. Um, and in residency, we're only taught to code, not how to charge. I have no idea how much we charged in residency. Zero. And a lot of the doctors that I know now who work for big corporations have no idea how much a level three new patient versus a four established mm -hmm. is. Um, the market right now, there's 49.9 million people without health insurance. Um, I think even with Obamacare, that number is still going to stay plenty high to support us. Uh, a lot of people are not going to be able to get this, and there's going to be a big gap in between. I take care of um, mostly hardworking, middle-class people. Um, about 80% of my patients have some form of insurance, and the other 20% have no insurance. So again, I think that will stay about the same. Um, one of the other things about um, where the patients can come from is the wait time at my office is very low. So most people we can get in that very day. Some patients just come to establish with us who have great insurance. Um, they can see their primary care doctors when they're not that sick, and they can come see us when they're really sick. And we'll get them in that same day if they're established. Okay, all of this, I don't know what this is. I'm glad I don't know what this is, but I'm pretty sure this is not why I went to medical school. That is not medicine. 
So starting from scratch, which is pretty much how I did it, um, I worked in a local ER and got a feel for the area. I knew that's the area I wanted to work. I knew the nurses I liked. I knew the specialist I liked. I already knew who I wanted to work with. I um, liberated one of the uh, staff from the ER and had her come work with me. <laughs> I also found a well-established physician who had an extra room, and I first started extremely small, and I just borrowed his space and his tools and his tongue depressors and slowly gave them back. <laughs> so, so as far as the, the bath, again, just keep it simple. How much do you want to make? I see that the doctor's incomes have been going down progressively over the past four decades compared to the rest of the population. So I looked at how much did an internal medicine doctor and a pediatrician, that average, how much do they make? And I want to make that much, or maybe even a little bit more. Um, so I doubled um, the average medical office, oh, uh, I doubled that to cover for my overhead, divide by the number of days a week I wanted to work, which I want to work four days a week, and then, um, divided that by how many hours and then how many patients, and that's it. So that's how I actually did it, and that's how much I charge, and it works. So here's a little run sheet. Um, we had some people before who said it didn't work, but it, it works pretty good. <laughs> so it's kind of simple. So I, um, you can see 16 patients for 30 minutes a patient, charge an average 125 a patient, and make 250 grand take home, which is nice. Um, staying very efficient. Um, I found a low-cost EMR. For me, it helps me. It's not tied to anything. Um, nobody has access to it. It's not part of the internet. But finding a good, for me, again, since I write like a psycho killer, I need something I can type the records on. Um, this one is amazing charts. It was made by a physician, and I think it's up to $1,000 one-time fee. So for me, that was a great one. I can cut and paste my templates in it, and it saves me a lot of time. You know, I have a psych template, an OB template, or a GYN template, rather, um, sports physical, and I can just cut and paste those in and make quick changes if I need to. Um, when I hired staff, again, I found um, a young assistant from the ER that I knew I liked, that I knew was good with people. That's actually in our office. Um, I did hire a really good office manager in the beginning because I didn't know what I was doing, and I did Craigslist instead of eBay, but that's how I got my supplies. <laughs> so I bought used equipment, and I would slowly, and I, I still have this table, but I slowly started upgrading as... I could afford it. But I did not want to take out any loans at all. I wanted to just keep it as simple as possible. I didn't want to be indebted to anybody, including myself. I negotiate. Um, there's two, fortunately for me, there's two lab companies in our area, and I change back and forth all the time. So um, I'm not afraid to negotiate and have them work against and with each other to get the best rates for anything, for labs, for um, medical waste, for anything. And that's really important. Don't just take what you get. Building the practice, um, it does help to have a big personality. It helps to get your personality out there. Um, the local news stories are great. That definitely is what got me off the ground. Um, business journals, um, I don't advertise in them, but if you do advertise in them, then they usually do do a story on you. So I've never uh, made, had anybody come in from an ad I've put, but I've had them do a story on me, which they have come in from. So you have to balance that out. Um, again, don't be afraid to promote yourself. I do the same thing when I'm in the grocery store and somebody sneezes. I tell them, I know a great doctor in town. <laughs> so, you know, and it works. <laughs> Um, know your personality and your medical style. If you like the natural medicine, go that way. Advertise it that way or, you know, market it that way. If you like um, just the bread and butter sort of thing, then, then market it that way. And that's what I like, just the old-fashioned kind of medicine. I like the Dr. Quinn medicine woman approach, and that's what my patients are like that too, and that's why I think it works really well. Those kind of patients want to come see me, and I want to take care of them. If you don't like it, charge more. I charge a ton for abscesses. I hate them. 
<laughs> I just can't stand them, but I charge more. So then if I do get them, well, I kind of like it then. So it all kind of works out. <laughs> so. If you hate it, don't do it. If you really don't like something, don't do it because the patient will know you hate it. Um, what didn't help very much were newspaper ads, except that they were inclined to do a story on us. Radio talk shows for me didn't bring in anybody, but that was really fun. Um, local media societies and local charities didn't help me very much, and gimmicks like flu shot coupons, I got one person came back in with a coupon. But I got to use my advertising degree, so it made me feel a little better. What helped the most, actually, were my kids. So um, just being involved in the community so people know you and know what kind of person you are, that is what helped the most. Um, uh, it was word of mouth. And when we started, we did, um, well, it's still VIP service. Everybody is a VIP in our office. But when it started, people would call and say, my kid is sick. Can they come in today? And we say, who is this? Oh, Mrs. Jones. Oh, for you, hold on, I think we can squeeze him in. We had like four patients all day. We're like, we're gonna squeeze him in at <laughs> one o'clock. <laughs> so, but it, we'll squeeze him in. <laughs> so, and actually other doctors, I've had really good luck with other doctors helping out because they know I can get them in that day. I'll work with them. If they work for a big corporation, I can work with them and tell them, um, I'll take good care of Mrs. Smith today. She'll come back to you and you know what I'm gonna do. We offer unique services that other doctors can't. House calls, all my patients have my cell number. Um, upfront pricing, extremely better lab pricing. We make a lot of our income on labs because the local hospital charges $123 for a CBC and we charge $15. So we save them a lot of money and we also make money that way. So it's a win-win. We have a, I make, sure I have a very good staff. If you ha are a great doctor and you have a bad staff, you still won't have good patients. Um, we give teachers and preachers discounts. Um, we do it partly because it sounds good and those are good people to give a discount to, but we also do it because those are the connectors in your community. Those are the people who talk to everybody else. So that works out really well. Um, we do free visits. If you're an established patient who gets cancer, we see you for free. We actually see new patients who have cancer for free too if they're referred over. Um, you get $5 off if you come in wearing spurs. I'm like, I'm, I like cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> we do the house calls like we talked about. And missionary kids and rescued kids get seen for free too. Like uh, this is a kid from uh, Haiti. Uh, every patient's a VIP. We don't do price gouging. We work really hard on um, customer service because we are the ones they have to answer to. My fastest growing uh, um, population, this gentleman is actually 94. Mm. Um, he wrote me a really nice letter the other day that said, I make him feel young. Well, I think it was because I put him on oxygen, but <laughs> it's still kind of nice. Um, so the fastest growing population are the people who actually have Medicare but feel like they're not getting enough time with their regular doctors or they feel like they want a test and their other doctor won't do that. If they want a PSA and Medicare doesn't pay for that anymore, we explain to them the risk versus benefits and then we decide together as a team. Uh, we also, um, Mexican nationals are where I am in Texas. That's a very fast growing segment. They can get free medical care in Mexico a lot of times, but they can get better medical care here. And patients who need same day appointments. We actually leave, um, after, if it rains, we leave some of those um, openings. We move the regularly scheduled patients because that's the only time our Mexican workers will come in. Mm. So we try, we, Respect them for that. Getting out of Medicare, you have to do an opt-out affidavit. You have to renew it every year. Uh, the AEPS is a very good place to make sure you're doing that appropriately. Um, when I did it, when I got out, I had a little meeting with everybody. I invited the patients that I knew were big fans of mine, like patients who I had made house calls on their wife as she was dying of cancer, and had them come and explain to the other patients what they would get if they stayed with me that if that happened to them, I'd be there for them. I didn't ask them to, we just, that's how the conversation went and I knew that they would help explain to the patients the benefit. 
Everybody has to do an opt-out. Those are my parents. Even they've signed an opt-out with me. So you have to make sure that everybody gets that. Um, I wrote a script in the beginning so everybody would literally be on the same page. I have a copy of the script if you want it. I was very scared when I got out of Medicare um, just because everybody told me it wouldn't work and that I was not taking care of the elderly and I didn't want to be an internist that only saw people under 65, but it actually did work. Um, and it works because people get to choose where their health care dollars go. I have two billionaires in my practice and I have immigrant workers. So it is, we have people from all sectors of life and it's worthwhile for all of them or they wouldn't be there. Um, there's no outside organization that tells them or me what to do and my incentive is to them. I have to keep them happy. The benefit is that I get a lot of time with the patient. I have lower overhead. I have much more flexibility. I can't even imagine having to ask somebody else for a day off. I mean, that hurts my heart to think about. Um, I have more empowered patients and I have a true doctor-patient relationship. No government, no HIPAA. I can be generous with patients. I can be cautious and get reimbursed more with the patients I choose. If people ask for narcotics, they, it's a bigger charge. It's harder work and it's more dangerous for me. Um, or if they're just difficult patients, I can charge more for difficult patients. That's okay. <laughs> and I get a lot more time with my family. Um, I don't know if you guys want to know this, but just on these, they're just crazy new things coming. So if you're not already out, get out because nobody wants to have to deal with this. 140,000 ways to accuse you of fraud. Um, this is my favorite though. Here are some of the new ICD-10 codes. They're struck by turtle, initial encounter. <laughs> struck by turtle, subsequent encounter. And struck by turtle, sequelae. There's also this one, drowning and submersion due to fall or jumping from burning water skis or burned due to water skis on fire. Now don't confuse these two, okay? I did an internet search and you can find almost anything on the internet. But there is no, not one single recorded case on the internet of anybody being burned while on water skis. <laughs> Zero. But I'm glad they have that code. And the ICD-11 codes are on their way. So, and this is, this is not going to get better. It's just going to get worse. I like that other contact with dolphin. <laughs> and there's one code for bit by macaw. There's one code for bit by parrot. God forbid you mix those up and get sued for fraud. So I love going to work every day. I love making house calls. You learn so much when you make house calls. It's amazing. Um, I, the patients see me as their family. I get invited to weddings and funerals. I have two babies named after me. Uh, cool. So One of them, they have 11 kids, so I think they kind of ran out of names, but still, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> so, uh, and I really do get treated like doctors in the old days. People bring me peaches and pies and jams, and it's just neat. It's really fun to have that two-way relationship. And you feel like a big deal, even in a small town. And it's truly a private practice. What happens between the patient and I stays between the two of us. So I would tell you, if you're not doing this, think about doing this. Keep that doctor-patient relationship pure. Don't let anything get between the two of you. Keep those patients close. We have the best healthcare in the world right now. Um, we need to keep it that way, and the only way it's gonna be that way is if we as doctors, from our good medical training, do what we were medically trained to do, not what somebody else wants us to do. So fight for your patients, empower your patients, love your patients, let your patients love you, remember why you went to medical school, and spend every day doing the stuff you love because it is so much fun to do it this way. And there's my family. Great. Seems like every one of the speakers triggers a thought in my mind. On page 73 of our book, Your, uh, Your Health Matters, uh, there's a story about uh, my doctor. I went to a, a large clinic uh, which is now part of a large ACO, which is part of why I'm not there anymore. And uh, this was in 1992. I was having a heart flutter. I didn't know what else to call it. And he gave me a number of tests. And then he looked at me, and I'll never forget this. He said, um, 
well, I think your heart is really good, but you might want to have a stress test. And I looked at him and I said, how much does that cost? You know, nobody trained me to say that. It just came out. I said, how much does that cost? And he had the dumbest look on his face. And He's a great guy. I love him. I still love him. He said, I don't know. Uh, three or four hundred dollars, maybe? And I said, well, doctor, I don't have insurance. And he said, well, you don't need the test. I've never forgotten this. <laughs> By the way, that's the way we start the chapter on defensive doctoring. Um, and, uh, and I don't, you know, I don't hold him for that. I just thought it was honest and, uh, and truthful. He and I remained patient and friend for a long time before he retired. Uh, he came in with the laptop one day, looking down, doing this, and he said, I thought I could get out before this happened. And uh, uh, that kind of ruined his practice, I think, having to go to that. Well, I just mentioned uh, clinical practice, a larger practice, and that's, uh, I think, appropriate. Dr. Merlin Brown will be coming up here, uh, who has a, a direct pay practice, but in a clinical setting with several other uh, practitioners. And that was what primarily drew me to, uh, to asking him to come and explain how that experience is a little bit different from uh, what you all have. So here we go from Marble Falls, Texas to Burnsville, Bloomington, Edina, Southwestern metro area, uh, I think five doctors in the practice, whatever. Dr. Merlin Brown, welcome. Thanks for coming and listening to our stories. I'll try to keep you interested at this time of the morning. Um, just a little background, I'm an internal medicine doc in private practice in Edina, uh, suburb here in Minnesota. I've been practicing for 20 years. I moved here to Minnesota in 1995, inexperienced, joined a large practice because that's where security, uh, I was told where you could find job security. Worked great for the first couple of years, got nice raises, year one, two, and three. Uh, year four, we got a big pay cut because the company was having financial difficulties. Year five, another big pay cut, mm -hmm. and one of their strategies to save costs was to show us budgets and show how we could practice more cost-efficient medicine. So I was energized, uh, looked at the budgets, and uh, tried to cut overhead. And they said, you can't cut overhead, you have to see more patients. Mm -hmm. It's the only way you can uh, balance the budget. It was very frustrating. So in 2000, I quit the big box clinic, joined a private practice, five internal medicine doctors, uh, successful practice, been around well now for 40 years. And this weight was lifted from my shoulders. And it was great to be in charge of my own, uh, my own practice. Uh, like I've heard before, I didn't have to ask for time off. How long should I spend with a patient? You know, I paid myself, it was great. But there was still a problem, and that was insurance companies. And insurances were very irritating at that point. A lot of paperwork. Uh, the formularies would change every year. We had to change drugs, you know, coding issues. You've heard the stories from the other docs. It's ridiculous. It was very frustrating. Over the next couple of years, the requirements went up. And it became more than just frustrating. It became expensive ended up costing us a lot of money for more administrators, more, more assistance, more of my time with coding. And, and in private practice, when you really understand that where the money goes, it was ridiculous to spend all this money on administrative uh, costs that really didn't help patient care. Then in the last few years, um, the insurance contracts became worse, and they, would, uh, they became what I call unethical. I think at this point it's, it's absolutely not ethical to contract with insurance companies anymore by the direction uh, we're headed. Uh, you've heard uh, about ACOs and medical home and pay for performance. Uh, basically uh, what that means is that I'm, I am paid to practice cost-effective uh, cost medicine. Um, great marketing line, we all want to save costs, we all want to be efficient. Uh, but what that means is that I'm paid to withhold care from patients. And I brought that up in meetings at Fairview, and they say, that's ridiculous, who would do that? And I say, well, you do that. If I don't order their MRI, you, you give me a bonus because I've saved money. And they can't deny that. Even worse is pay for performance. 
You've heard that, right? Sounds great, great marketing line. We all want to practice quality medicine. We all want to perform well. So, so it's a great marketing line, but what that really means with an insurance contract is that I cannot individualize care. That means I have to treat every patient the same. And if I deviate from that, I'm punished. I get a failing grade and I get less money. Uh, for example, I have a diabetic who has high cholesterol. He developed severe rhabdomyolysis, got admitted to the hospital with kidney failure. He was in there for 10 days. So of course I don't give him the statin. Now every time my charts are reviewed, I get a failing grade and I get paid less because I'm practicing good medicine, I'm individualizing care. But on the other hand, I could give him the statin again, his cholesterol would drop, he'd get a passing grade, he'd get more money, and then he dies, but guess what? Nobody cares. I got paid more and I got a passing grade. This is ridiculous. You can't go to see a doctor who is paid to withhold care, who is paid not to think, who is paid to be a data collector to report to some administrator who's making more money than you, who works nine to five. <laughs> so, so I felt like I did not want to be part of that any longer. So I told my partners, uh, the other four partners, they said, I am ending my contracts with insurance companies. I'm going to go to cash-based. And they said, fine, um, I'm kind of viewed a little bit as a rebel, maybe. And uh, so I was going to stay in the office, share a call. I was just going to lease the staff in the space and just uh, uh, take cash. Well, as, as the insurance requirements continued to go up, and they were trying to adopt medical home and meaningful use and ACOs, and you've heard all this stuff, you know all the ridiculousness that goes into that. You know, I said, go ahead, you know, go ahead and do that. I'm not going to be part of it. But when they saw my business plan and how happy I was, uh, they all decided to join me. So all of a sudden now the stress went up because now here's a five physician group uh, renting, you know, high cost office space across, across from Fairview Hospital, you know, with 12 staff that depends on us for their job. And, and we're going cash based. So, but uh, we took the plunge and as of April of this year, uh, we ended our contracts with private insurance companies. Uh, we did what I've heard some others have done is we still maintain Medicare because uh, Medicare patients have less options. So, so here we're a practice with 8,000 patients uh, who are used to business as usual and all of a sudden the insurance changes uh, or, or the, uh, the way we look at insurance changes. So uh, a lot of letters went out, a lot of phone calls, a lot of education, uh, a lot of pain because there's so much confusion. Insurances were not happy with us, so they sent out letters to all our patients telling them they could no longer see us. And of course, insurances are like, God, you know, he might do things you don't like, but you do whatever they tell you. So all these patients say, I can't come anymore because I got this letter. In fact, you care uh, for seniors was so bad that they actually had to retract it. They were afraid they could get sued because some of our patients went to the attorney general complaining about how false the letter was. So it kind of solidified our, our decision to end our contracts with insurance companies because they continued to function unethically. So, so what does that mean for our practice now? So we're not contracted with insurance companies. We don't have to follow their rules. Now that means we can actually work for the patient. Uh, that means uh, the patient is the customer. They can demand the kind of care and the services they want and we're free to give them that care. We're free to individualize care without false incentives. We can now provide care uh, that we did not get reimbursed for before. Uh, we provide a broad spectrum of services. Um, we, uh, we do a la carte, fee-for-service. You pay for you know, each individual service that you get from a doctor visit to an EKG lab test. Uh, we also have something called enhanced primary care. For a yearly fee, uh, you get my cell phone, my email, texting. Uh, some patients really like that. You know, diabetics text me their, their blood sugars. I text back insulin changes. Works really well. Uh, we also offer uh, full concierge service uh, for a couple thousand a year. Uh, you get everything, uh, no questions asked. So we're very flexible. We want to include everybody. Uh, and, and so far, you know, as far as the success of this, uh, we're headed in the right direction, but as all of you know, uh, this is like starting a new practice. Uh, we budgeted for a loss of about 75% of our patients. 
Um, and at this point, we've lost about 40%. So I, I say that's a huge success. And right now, what we've learned uh, from uh, the insurance interaction with us, uh, we're starting a marketing program to show how, uh, you know, they, how we interact with their insurance with invoices and uh, unfortunately uh, coded uh, so that they can get some reimbursement. But insurance is still our number one problem because most of our patients still have insurance. Uh, we haven't built up a practice, uh, enough patients yet of uninsured, so we still have to give them, you know, that uh, coded bill. But at this point, I don't care about the codes just enough to get them paid because they don't really mean anything more, more than that at this point. So uh, some of our, we've had very good support from our patients. I've gotten uh, baked goods, uh, flowers, congratulating on the change. Um, uh, talk show hosts have called us up, the newspaper's been out. Um, our practice, uh, we're, one of the, we're the last independent internal medicine practice in the southwest metro of the city. Um, our doctors are, um, ha have, been on, have been chief of staff at Fairview Southdale Hospital, so we're, we're kind of on the radar and everybody's watching us. And, and we want to make it clear that we're, we're making the, this change as part of a broad health care reform push. Uh, I agree with what everybody else has, has set out and repeat it, but I think quality medicine uh, really has to head this direction. Uh, if you look at another business, let's say Apple Computer, very successful, great products. Uh, what do you think would happen if a third party uh, told them, uh, what, serve, what uh, kind of computers they could sell, what features they could have, who they could sell it to, how often they could sell it. What do you think the computer would look like now if they operated like that? My prediction is that if we work for the patients and are free to be creative and offer the services that they want, uh, that we won't even recognize medicine in a couple of years. So that's where we are. We are amazingly on schedule, uh, just five minutes off, and that's terrific. We want to give you a break. Um, we're going to be really disciplined about this because we're going to come back with a panel with all of these presenters, uh, and this can oftentimes be the best part of the whole presentation. So I hope you've been taking some notes and you have some questions in your mind, uh, tough questions, easy questions, fun questions, and everything in between. Please uh, be back in here ready to go, and let's do it at 10.35 uh, promptly.